This is a pond in a rural area near Albany, New York, USA. I visited it between 5 and 7 p.m. on 17 September 2016 to film microorganisms in the water. Here's a shot of the water next to a rock right at the shore. The water is only about 1.5 centimeters deep here. A lot of stuff is floating around, but it's hard to tell which things are alive. To get a better view, I scooped up water with a clear plastic cup and then filmed the contents of the water using my microscope camera, as shown here. I also sometimes filmed the underside of the cup. When it got dark, I brought about 100 milliliters of water home for further filming on a plastic tray. To give a sense of scale, the width of the screen here is almost exactly 8 millimeters. As you can see, there are myriads of living creatures swimming around in the water, most of which I can't identify. This page lists a variety of types of organisms that can live in fresh water. The purpose of this investigation was to improve my knowledge about the kinds of creatures that live in pond water, as well as to build empathy for these organisms by seeing them up close. As with invertebrates on land, zooplankton and other aquatic microorganisms are born involuntarily into short lives that often end in painful deaths. Although for protists and bacteria, one can debate whether they should be considered to be able to suffer. Aquatic food chains involve many layers of predation, and many of these organisms will end up being eaten by someone slightly bigger. I favor policies that reduce the numbers of aquatic organisms that are born. As is the case on land, the most certain way to reduce aquatic organism suffering is probably to reduce net primary productivity. Humans affect aquatic productivity via eutrophication, climate change, acid rain, and so on. It's important to research whether these anthropogenic impacts increase or decrease populations of aquatic organisms on balance. According to this page, quote, the world's lakes have a combined surface area of about 5 million square kilometers, which is 3.7% of the Earth's non-glaciated land area, end quote. That number is based on an analysis that counted lakes, quote, down to a size of 0 0.2 hectares, roughly the size of one and a half Olympic-sized swimming pools or half a football field. This size threshold would include what are commonly referred to as lakes, reservoirs, and ponds, end quote. This page says, quote, in aquatic environments such as ponds, lakes, rivers, and oceans, innumerable living beings have their home. If the water is green in color, or if it has heaps of disgusting-looking greenish stuff in it, this means it is very rich in life. End quote. This page says, quote, Animals of fresh waters are extremely diverse and include representatives of nearly all phyla. The zooplankton include animals suspended in water with limited powers of locomotion. Like phytoplankton, they are usually denser than water and constantly sink by gravity to lower depths. The distinction between suspended zooplankton having limited powers of locomotion and animals capable of swimming independently of turbulence, the latter referred to as nectin, is often diffuse. Freshwater zooplankton are dominated by four major groups of animals, protozoa, rotifers, and two subclasses of the crustacea, the cladocerans and copepods. The planktonic protozoa have limited locomotion, but the rotifers, cladocerin, and copepod microcrustaceans, and certain immature insect larvae, often move extensively in quiescent water. End quote. This page says, quote, 
Zooplankton are tiny animals suspended in the water column. Like phytoplankton, these species have developed mechanisms that keep them from sinking to deeper waters, including drag-inducing body forms and the active flicking of appendages, such as antennae or spines. Remaining in the water column may have its advantages in terms of feeding, but this zone's lack of refugia leaves zooplankton vulnerable to predation. In response, some species, especially Daphnia species, make daily vertical migrations in the water column by passively sinking to the darker, lower depths during the day and actively moving towards the surface during the night. Also, because conditions in a lentic system can be quite variable across seasons, zooplankton have the ability to switch from laying regular eggs to resting eggs when there is a lack of food, temperatures fall below 2 degrees Celsius, or if predator abundance is high. These resting eggs have a diapause, or dormancy period, that should allow the zooplankton to encounter conditions that are more favorable to survival when they finally hatch." End quote. I think this is a copepod. I created this drop of water containing it using a water dropper to get a better look at it. It swam around in circles. Not wanting it to suffer too long from this restricted space, I soon reconnected this water droplet with the rest of the water so that the copepod could return to the bigger collection of water from which it came. Most of the organisms you see swimming here look to me to be copepods. Bill Nye expressed his feelings about these creatures in the following clip. I love copepods. I'm cuckoo for copepods. Cuckoo for copepods. Bill. Cuckoo for copepods. This page says, quote, copepods are tiny crustaceans, so they are cousins of crayfish and water fleas. You can see them with your eyes, but they don't get much bigger than two millimeters. Copepods eat other tiny plankton organisms, including bacteria, protozoans, amoeba, paramecium, euglena, etc., tiny insect larvae, including mosquitoes, and other crustaceans. They will even eat other copepods. Copepods also eat tiny bits of plant and animal matter floating in the current. Female copepods are much larger than males. After mating, the females carry clusters of eggs called ovisacs. Eggs can take anywhere from 12 hours to 5 days to hatch. Each tiny larva, called a nauplius, swims away from its mother after it hatches. The nauplius will eat and grow, going through 11 stages before it becomes an adult copepod. When it is born, the nauplius doesn't look at all like the adult. For instance, it doesn't have all its legs and is much smaller. With each new stage, the copepod gains legs, other body parts, and size. The entire life cycle can last anywhere from one week to six months, depending on the temperature and environment. Copepods can occur in huge numbers. Sometimes over 1,000 copepods have been found in one liter of water. End quote. This page says, quote, Copepods, meaning oar feet, are a group of small crustaceans found in the sea and nearly every freshwater habitat. Some 13,000 species of copepods are known, and 2,800 of them live in fresh water. Most copepods have a single median compound eye, usually bright red and in the center of the transparent head. The second pair of cephalic appendages in free-living copepods is usually the main time-average source of propulsion, beating like oars to pull the animal through the water. However, different groups have different modes of feeding and locomotion, ranging from almost immodal for several minutes, e.g. some harpactacoid copepods, to intermittent motion, e.g. some cyclopoid copepods, and continuous displacements, 
with some escape reactions, e.g. most calanoid copepods. Finding a mate in the three-dimensional space of open water is challenging. Some copepod females solve the problem by emitting pheromones, which leave a trail in the water that the male can follow. During mating, the male copepod grips the female with his first pair of antennae, which is sometimes modified for this purpose. The male then produces an adhesive package of sperm and transfers it to the female's genital opening with his thoracic limbs. Eggs are sometimes laid directly into the water, but many species enclose them within a sac attached to the female's body until they hatch. Copepods are usually the dominant members of the zooplankton and are major food organisms for small fish such as the dragonet, banded killifish, whales, seabirds, Alaska pollock, and other crustaceans such as krill. Some scientists say they form the largest animal biomass on Earth. Because of their smaller size and relatively faster growth rates than krill, and because they are more evenly distributed throughout more of the world's oceans, copepods almost certainly contribute far more to the secondary productivity of the world's oceans and to the global ocean carbon sink than krill, and perhaps more than all other groups of organisms together. End quote. This page explains, quote, copepods are very alert and evasive. They have large antennae. When they spread their antennae, they can sense the pressure wave from an approaching fish and jump with great speed over a few centimeters, end quote. This page says, quote, a single copepod may eat from 11,000 to 373,000 diatoms in 24 hours, end quote. That's equivalent to 0.1 to 4 diatoms per second. This page explains, quote, In order to obtain their food, many copepods create water currents, which transport particles to the mouth, where they are concentrated, sorted, and captured with the feeding appendages. Although the morphology and movements of the mouth parts suggest that copepods gather food by mechanically filtering water, in fact, they can individually select food items according to its abundance, size, and nutritive value. All this information is obtained with the mechanical and chemical sensors distributed in the antennae and mouth parts. End quote. This article says in its abstract, quote, chemically mediated food selection was studied with combinations of living algae and algal flavored and untreated polystyrene spheres. The freshwater calanoid Eudioptomus exhibited a strong preference for flavored spheres over untreated spheres when algae were scarce, but ingested few spheres of either type when algae were abundant. End quote. The article's introduction explains, quote, Recently, experiments have demonstrated that some zooplankton taxa discriminate against inert particles. These experiments, which have focused on calanoid copepods, can be divided into two categories. One kind of experiment has shown that marine calanoid copepods feed selectively on living algae in preference to polystyrene spheres of similar size. A second kind of experiment involves selection between chemically treated and untreated artificial particles. Poulet and Marceau, 1978-1980, demonstrated that marine copepods can select semi-permeable microcapsules enriched with phytoplankton homogenate over unenriched microcapsules. A similar approach uses the property of polystyrene spheres to adsorb flavors from algal cultures. Experiments with diverse taxa of freshwater zooplankton revealed a wide range of responses to mixtures of chlamydomonas flavored and untreated spheres. Some species, including the calanoid copepod Diaptomus sisoloides, 
selectively ingested flavored spheres, whereas others, including the Clodocerin Daphnia, did not discriminate between flavored and untreated spheres. Adsorbed chemicals can, however, lead electrochemically to differential uptake of bacteria-sized artificial particles by Daphnia. Direct visual observations with high-speed cinematography have recently shown that suspension-feeding copepods can detect, capture, and manipulate individual food particles. Chemical cues may be important in both distance detection and in determining whether captured particles are ingested or rejected." End quote. This page says, quote, a general positive correlation exists between the rates of production of phytoplankton and of zooplankton. End quote. This page says, quote, the zooplankton can display a high degree of spatial variation, even when considering only the open water, limnetic region of a lake. This patchiness results from a variety of factors, including water currents and rapid population growth in locations where phytoplankton biomass is high. Zooplankton biomass may vary considerably from month to month and between successive years. Rapid increases in biomass, sometimes two orders of magnitude, may occur in just one week in response to a bloom of edible algae and bacteria and or a rise in spring water temperature. Sudden crashes in biomass may happen just as quickly in response to intense fish predation, collapse of algal blooms, and other factors." End quote. This page reports that small zooplankton like rotifers and copepod nauplii can have densities of over a thousand per liter. This page reports zooplankton densities in Rush Lake in Wisconsin. Zooplankton numbers were typically between 100 and 200 per liter. A liter is a cubic decimeter, so this is equivalent to 100,000 to 200,000 per cubic meter of water. Densities of copepods specifically were between 10 and 20 per liter. It should be noted that these zooplankton measurements were taken six years after the fish toxicant antimycin was used in the lake. This study of two reservoirs in Turkey found around 100 zooplankton per liter. This table also shows densities of zooplankton of around 100 per liter. Here are numbers of copepods from the order Calanoida. Based on eyeballing the small water sample that I collected, I would guess there were at least 100 copepods per liter, if not more. Let's assume conservatively that this density of copepods was only found in the top decimeter of water throughout the pond. Here's a picture of the pond on Google Maps. Using the scale at the bottom right corner, I'll approximate this pond as a triangle 500 feet tall and 200 feet wide at the base. That implies an area of half a million square decimeters. Assuming 100 copepods per cubic decimeter in only the top decimeter of the pond, that implies 50 million copepods in this pond, which is probably very conservative. This page says, quote, some key water chemistry attributes that directly affect zooplankton are pH, aluminum, heavy metals, and calcium. Attributes that indirectly affect zooplankton by altering the biomass and composition of their food, algae, bacteria, protozoa, include nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus. The extent to which resources versus consumers control zooplankton is highly variable among lakes. The food web in which zooplankton occurs is quite complex, with some carbon and energy flows directly from algae to zooplankton, some from bacteria to zooplankton, and some indirectly from algae and bacteria to zooplankton by way of intermediate consumers, 
including ciliates and flagellates, protozoa. That indirect route is often referred to in the literature as the microbial web or microbial loop. During certain times of the year, grazing by large zooplankton like Daphnia can clear the water of phytoplankton. This most often occurs during spring in temperate lakes when the phytoplankton is dominated by small edible species. In nutrient-rich eutrophic lakes, such clear water periods often are followed by a crash in biomass of the large zooplankton and a shift in the phytoplankton to less edible blue-green algae. During that time of the year, the zooplankton tends to be dominated by rotifers and other small zooplankton, which may largely feed on bacteria and protozoa." End quote. This page discusses copepod nervous systems. The sections on mechanoreceptors say, quote, there are two re-identifiable mechanoreceptor units, A and B, in each antenna. These originate in the sensory CT of each distal tip. They are sensitive to very small, less than 10 nanometer, hydrodynamic signals, including abrupt displacements and sinusoidal vibrations. Their frequency range for sensitivity to oscillatory stimuli is unusual for aquatic arthropods extending up to and above 2 kilohertz. They can fire impulses at exceptionally high rates, up to several kilohertz. They can follow, i.e. phase lock 2, oscillatory stimuli to 2 kilohertz or so. Cetal receptors are differentiated along the length of the calenoid antenna, with the spiniform CT of the distal tip more adapted for mechanoreception while those of the antennal shaft seem adapted for gustatory, i.e. contact mechanochemo reception. End quote. The article also has sections on escape behavior. It says, quote, Escapes often begin with a rapid reorientation away from the source of disturbance, animals turning at rates of 30 degrees per millisecond. Interestingly, when escapes in acarcia are elicited by sudden dimming of the light falling on them, the reaction time is much longer, 30 milliseconds, than to mechanical stimuli, and their escape jumps cover much more ground, several centimeters compared to just a few millimeters. This difference in escape response may relate to photic stimuli, shadows, being more likely to represent a threat from a visual predator than mechanical stimuli. A visual predator cannot see a copepod in the dark when it can't cast a shadow that might warn the prey. Presumably the copepod must put more distance between it and the predator if the predator might track it visually. Morphological studies of the substrates of sensory triggering of the escape reaction have revealed that some, but not all, copepods have their nerve fibers ensheathed in a fatty multi-layered wrapping called myelin. In fact, the taxa that possess myelinated axons correspond very nicely to those with very small sensory neuron impulses. Myelin is the feature that speeds nerve impulse propagation in vertebrates and allows a large animal to react rapidly enough to survive. The copepods that have myelin react much more rapidly to sudden water movements, such as those a predator would make, than those lacking myelin. The copepods that possess myelin are found in a greater diversity of ecosystems, including in more risky oceanic environments, than those that don't. Part of the explanation for this seems to be their faster reaction to predators. There are several interesting implications of these findings. In terms of basic biology, they erode the basic dogma that myelin is primarily a vertebrate invention. Although myelin has been known in a few invertebrates, and it was reported once in a copepod and overlooked for almost 20 years, it was not realized that so many copepods have it, or what its significance is. 
given the vast numbers of calanoid copepods in the ocean. It may even be argued that there are more invertebrates with myelin than vertebrates. Because it seems to be absent from more primitive copepods, it would appear that it has evolved independently by the more advanced forms. In terms of nervous system mechanisms, it used to be thought that mechanisms for increasing nervous system communication speeds are unimportant for small animals, since all parts of the animal are in very rapid communication anyway. Finding myelin in copepods, as well as giant nerve fibers in copepods and drosophila, shows that every millisecond counts. Myelin potentially shortens the reaction time for a 2 mm copepod by reducing nerve conduction time about 2 milliseconds. Compared to circa 6 milliseconds for an unmyelinated species, this is a significant fraction of an already very fast reaction. End quote. This study says, quote, Here we present an anatomical characterization of the brain and central nervous system, of the well-studied Harpacticoid copepod species, Tigriopus californicus. We show that this species is endowed with a complex brain possessing a central complex comprising a protocerebral bridge and central body." End quote. This study says, quote, when exposed to non-turbulent followed by turbulent conditions, the copepod Centropagus hamidus initially responded with numerous escape reactions and increased foraging behavior. However, when the cycle of non-turbulent followed by turbulent flow was repeated for several consecutive cycles, the two behaviors followed distinctly different patterns. Foraging effort increased during the first two cycles and then remained at high levels during both turbulent and non-turbulent periods period durations of 12.5 and 25 minutes. In contrast, escape behavior habituated rapidly during each turbulent period and dishabituated during each non-turbulent period. These response patterns are suited to the strongly intermittent nature of oceanic turbulence and allow C. hamatus to utilize the benefits of enhanced encounter rate while minimizing the expense of unnecessary escape responses." End quote. This paper says, quote, Under the influence of intermittent turbulence and biological activity, zooplankton depend on its turbulent environment for feeding, predator avoidance, and reproduction. The definition of plankton is a living organism mainly advected by marine currents and turbulence. However, recent studies showed that many zooplankton species possess swimming abilities, which may compete in calm conditions with advection provided by turbulent currents. Under the influence of the medium, swimming behavior was constrained by evolution, and zooplankton developed behavior strategies to optimize their exploitation of the high variability of the surrounding environment. This means increasing their encounter rate while minimizing the energy spending for displacements. The resulting behavior of copepods is often highly erratic, with a succession of swimming activities, occasional jumps, and rest periods." End quote. This study says, quote, Despite their ecological importance, the issue of sexual selection in pelagic copepods has received little attention. This may partially be due to the assumption that reproduction in copepods is mainly encounter-limited. Recently, mate encounter processes, and in particular mate search behavior of males, have been thoroughly studied. These studies document sophisticated mating behaviors, including male tracking of cues produced by females, elaborate dances, and female escape behavior. Aspects of copepod mating strategies, including morphological, physiological, and behavioral traits, suggest that encounters between fertile mates do not necessarily lead to successful copulations. Complicated pre-copulatory dances. 
Sophisticated precopulatory behavior is a common component of mate choice. Copepods exhibit various examples of such behaviors. The best example is P. elongatus, in which both sexes engage in a precopulatory dance when the male has located the female. During the dance, which may last for more than five minutes, the couple makes repeated contact every 10 to 20 seconds. Sometimes the female performs short escape jumps. Species that use hydromechanical signals for mate recognition also engage in a long series of communicative hopping before copulation. In O. davosi, the male hops between pheromone patches generated by hopping chemically advertising females. The male either captures the female or loses the track. However, as exemplified with O. davosi, it is often difficult to distinguish mate search from courtship. Male behavior is commonly directed at a specific female, and this courtship may represent a way of checking female mating status to avoid wasting valuable spermatophores. In addition, both males and females may use courtship performance to assess the quality of mates. Precopulatory dancing may also serve an important species recognition function, as fruitless interspecific mating occurs in several copepods. Escaping Females sometimes escape pursuing males, and this occurs in species that use both chemical and hydrodynamic signals to advertise their readiness to mate. Despite the complex courtship dances of C. marshalli, most ended without copulation as the female typically abandoned the male with intensive escape jumps. In other species, females also shake off males that have attached themselves to the female's body. The fact that females first employ pheromones to attract males and then escape when encountered suggests female mate choice. Female escape behavior also suggests a conflict of interest between sexes over mating. As a potential counter to female escape behavior, males of many calanoids have geniculate antennae and a fifth, sometimes chelate leg that they use to catch and hold the female. Stroking. In some copepods, males exhibit elaborate behaviors directed towards getting the female to accept a spermatophore placement. In some species, males use their fifth leg to stroke the ventral surface of the female's genital segment prior to copulation. Such persuasive actions typically exist in mating systems with female choice. Precopulatory behavior may also be tied to postcopulatory choice of sperm i.e. cryptic female choice, if females are more likely to store and use sperm from males that first provide the right stimulation." End quote. Thank you.